This is this uh, talk is part of the of a lecture series by Lou Lou R. Hughes, who has been one of our sponsors here, and so uh, we're pleased to be able to offer uh, what is obviously a topic of uh, enormous interest here in Washington and everywhere else, uh, as we look at the threats that are posed by terrorist groups and the importance of financing uh, as, a, as a resource for them. We're very pleased today that we've been able to secure uh, Amit Kumar, who is uh, someone I met a few years ago and have been watching the fact that he's very much in demand on this very subject. Uh, and uh, although he uh, has focused on South Asia, he's we found out is also well informed about about the uh, the Middle East in general uh, as far as financing, and so we've asked him to to sort of compare uh, <clears throat> the two and the circumstances uh, around financing uh, in in both both. And just to remind you, though, that the Middle East Institute has, from its founding, decided uh, at least a year after because of it was founded in 46 and and the Pakistan didn't come into existence until next year. But it has from the outset uh, thought of Afghanistan and Pakistan as part of the Middle East, the greater Middle East. Well, uh, now I'll let me just uh, have this opportunity to welcome Amit Kumar. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Marvin um, and Kate for inviting me. And I've been, I've literally grown up watching Marvin's marvelous work on, on both South Asia and Middle East. And it's such a long body of work. And that sort of gives you some idea of how old I am. Uh, uh, this, is, this is really a privilege. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, quickly run through some important uh, parameters of a comparative assessment of the South Asian terrorist financing networks versus Middle Eastern terrorist financing networks. Um, one is the motivation of the donors. Um, initially, um, the, the, and I would like to mention three, three events in 1979, which really set the tone for the study, uh, as well as the actual practice of statecraft. Uh, in 1979, the Soviets uh, invaded Afghanistan. The Iranian uh, revolution took place. And there was a storming of the Grand Mosque in, in Saudi Arabia. So these are three, uh, I would say, cataclysmic events from the standpoint of the birth of, of, of radical terrorism and, and its financing and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of motivations of donors, uh, as far as South Asia is concerned, they were anti-Soviet to begin with in the first Afghanistan war. Then in the second one, it's anti-US-led NATO coalition. And now the danger is with the announcement of the Al-Qaeda in South Asia regional uh, would be caliphate, as it were, by uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri about a month back. There is an anti-India focus. That's, that's what the fear of people in the region is. Um, as far as the Middle East is concerned, there was the anti-US focus in the Gulf War. And now it's an anti-Assad and anti-Shia focus. It suffices to say that both as far as South Asian terrorist financing networks go and the Middle Eastern uh, um, terrorist financing networks go, countries who are the donor countries, as it were, or the individuals, I'm not saying uh, countries per se have a state policy of donating to a certain cause. They may or may not. But the individuals, especially the rich donors, do in big numbers sometimes, they, they do try to cater to the domestic constituencies in the South Asian case in Pakistan, uh, some of the more radical elements, probably some elements of the, the army, um, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the donors uh, do want to cater to their domestic constituencies and appease them so that they don't cause damage uh, within their countries. Uh, in the same way, in, uh, as far as the Middle Eastern countries are concerned, the domestic constituencies, uh, especially the radical ones, have to be catered to. And the Gulf donors, for example, are really mindful of that. And they want to make sure that these, uh, these forces uh, are appeased. And then 
they they're also mindful of the fact or may may not be mindful of the fact that these these forces may like to perpetrate terrorist acts outside their state uh, their their home states um, and that's why you have the 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 Sunni radical forces being diverted to Syria or the Sunni radical forces in the Gulf donating to causes in South Asia, either against the US or against Afghanistan or against India, as the case may be. The profile of donors is the second thing that's important. Generally, rich donors and unwitting smaller donors. When I say unwitting smaller donors, I'm looking essentially at, at unwitting donors in mosques uh, where you have collection boxes, really. Um, then the same thing would be, would be true of, of, of Middle Eastern terrorist financing networks also as it is of South Asian terrorist financing networks. Uh, many people question the fact whether the states are directly involved. Are there state sponsors or not? They may be directly involved or they may turn a blind eye to certain individuals under their nose uh, donating to causes like these, whether it's the anti-Indian cause uh, or the anti-US-led coalition cause in, in South Asia, or it's the Shia cause really, uh, or even the South Asian cause uh, in, in the Middle East. Um, the motivations of terrorist groups are a third important factor. They could be anti-Soviet, like the Mujahideen in the 1980s in Afghanistan. They could be the anti-US-led coalition as, as in the second Afghanistan experience that the US, has, you know, we've been involved in over the last 12 years. And then there could be anti-India as some of the groups in Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and India are concerned, like, you know, lashkar e taiba for example. Now, many people talk about lashkar e taiba as a Pakistani group. My sense is it's a South Asian group with reach in India, across South Asia, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. And it's got its funding. Uh, a lot of it comes from the Gulf as well. Um, so that's, that's, I think, an important connection as far as the sources of funding are concerned and, and the motivations. Similarly, in the Middle Eastern terrorist financing networks, there could be anti-Soviet, where the Gulf donors were, were donating to the cause of, of making the, the, the uh, Soviets leave Afghanistan or making the Americans... Uh, uh, leave Afghanistan in the second uh, um, uh, uh, stint, actually, uh, last 12 years. Um, now, now, there may be different motivations also. For example, ISIS's mo main motivation, beyond really the anti-Sunni uh, Sunni motivation, it, uh, the anti-Shia motivation and the anti-Assad motivation it has, is the, um, is the uh, really hunger for more territory and governing more territory across Syria and, and uh, Iraq. Now, some would say that their motivations have been diluted as far as taking out Assad is concerned. It also suffices to say that they, it looks more like they're content pretty much with uh, trying to consolidate their hold over territories, really. And in exciting donors and others, uh, foot soldiers outside Iran and Iraq to really contribute their their money, their resources. Uh, the fallacy generally when you talk about terrorist financing is it's only money that they're donating. It could be hands that they're donating. It could be kind. It could be material support. I mean, the U.S. Treasury's notion of material support is pretty extensive. It covers everything under the sun, from ideological support to motivation to training to messages to even legal assistance. So looking at terrorist financing as beyond money and looking at all kinds of economic resources uh, and financial means. Anything that money can buy, anything that has value. So it has to be looked at that context. What are the methods for raising and moving money in South Asia? Firstly, cash couriers, where people carry money on their bodies, really huge amounts sometimes, or they carry money in their vehicles, uh, cars, and so on and so forth. Could be charities. That's a very big source of the way money is raised and moved in South Asia. Could be illicit business fronts where you have fake companies, artificial fronts for charities or for illicit businesses. There is this question of hawala, um, where obviously hawala is, is used as illicit means of transferring funds by a lot of migrant workers in, in the Gulf when they remit funds to South Asia, it's used by them. So to condemn hawala and to guillotine hawaladars as, as evil, all of them, that's not really very sound.
because a lot of them are doing licit business activity. But but obviously, like anything else, anything licit gets contaminated by tainted money belonging to terrorists or criminals or money launderers. Uh, there is this as aspect of trade-based money laundering where trade is used to launder funds. And that takes place a lot between the Middle East and South Asia, the Gulf and South Asia, Dubai and South Asia, for example. So that's, that's an important element, really. Um, there is money laundering by uh, an organization called the D Company, which is basically headed by Dawood Ibrahim. It started off as a criminal syndicate, but is really involved big time in actual terrorist activity. And they're, they're hand in glove with terrorists big time. And, and they, they, they are spreading their tentacles across the Middle East uh, and now uh, Africa as well in terms of the relationship they have with Boko Haram. Um, because Boko Haram and, and uh, uh, the company headed by Dawood Abraham last year signed an agreement where uh, Boko Haram will be participating in drug trafficking um, in India, for example. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the D company will be helping them do that. So you have all these kind of networks and there's not one terrorist network, it could be multiple terrorist networks. There could be a terrorist network as a criminal network also. Uh, the same organization may double up as both, you may have separate. For example, in the case of lashkar e taiba or uh, the Afghan Taliban, a lot of their funds are laundered by Dawood Ibrahim. And Dawood Ibrahim is in cahoots with a lot of the, the, the uh, uh, radical forces, uh, either in Afghanistan or Pakistan or even in India sometimes. So that, I think, is an important thing. Uh, in terms of Middle Eastern terrorist financing networks, could be cash couriers, uh, could be laundering funds in the Middle East, as I said. Dawood Ibrahim launders his funds through Dubai and through the Bahamas eventually, where recently one of the banks in the Bahamas, one of the bra bank branches was discovered to, uh, to, to contain a few hundred thousand dollars belonging to Dawood Ibrahim. So he's parking his, his, his money everywhere. Um, and he also apparently siphons off a lot of his money uh, into the Karachi Stock Exchange and other stock exchanges also. Because one of the things that the criminals do best is launder money, which is basically disguising the source of their money from their destination. Um, there was this case of the HSBC, uh, uh, the subcommittee on investigations headed by Senator Levin two years ago, came with some interesting insights of what kind of exposure HSBC has. In the case of Bangladesh, South Asia, they discovered its corresponding banking relationships with Islami Bank, who apparently is, is, has got connections or get, got customers uh, or accounts belonging to Al-Qaeda listed individuals or otherwise. In the case of um, uh, HSBC's uh, correspondent relationship in Saudi Arabia with the Al Raji Bank, uh, the Al Raji uh, is one of the uh, uh, members of, of Bin Laden's golden chain of 20 biggest funders. Um, many listed individuals have, ha, ha, have connections to both South Asia and the Middle East. If you look at the US Treasury, in their listings over the last couple of years. A lot of the individuals, about a dozen I can count on my fingertips, who've had uh, uh, relationships uh, or operations both in South Asia as well as the Middle East. And they're listed as belonging to the Islamic State uh, or, uh, or um, Nusra Front or Al-Qaeda, for example. Um, in terms of transit points, Iran, interestingly, is used as a transit point for fighters and money from South Asia and the Middle East, as is Dubai, because Dubai is, is kind of got relatively lax money laundering controls, and it serves as a transshipment point for money and, and for, for all other kinds of uh, funds and individuals. A transshipment point uh, between not only the South Asia and Middle East, but outside these two regions as well. What is the direction of funds and fighters flow? So when I talked about material support, I was talking of funds as well as fighters, or sometimes funds pocketed by fighters, you know, cash couriers, for example. The, the trend has been from the Gulf states to South Asia, because if you look at the, the first Afghanistan war of the 1980s, a lot of the Mujahideen um, that comprised of what we call the Afghan Arabs. A lot of uh, folks from the Arab countries came and fought 
in the Mujahideen. Similarly, in the Second Front, I mean, obviously, it's after the 1990s and the uh, early 2000s, it's extended more to the Chechens and the others, the Uzbeks and the Central Asians also. But definitely, there is a lot of people from North Africa and the Gulf states as well. Um, from Gulf states, Central Asia to North America, South Asia, and in Iraq and Syria. Now what we're seeing is, uh, talking about the foreign fighters, in, in the case of ISIS, a lot of the foreign fighters uh, are from Tunisia or from Saudi Arabia, a few from Pakistan, and fewer still from India. So you see a, a constellation of fighters wherever there is the scene of action, you know. Um, and that's that's been the, the, the underlying theme that I'm trying to mention is that there is a lot of crisscross of funds and fighters and ideologies between South Asia and, and Gulf states, or the Middle East, as it were. Uh, I'm always puzzled by the fact that why does the US Central Command uh, end at, at Pakistan, and, and why doesn't it continue into India and thereabouts? Uh, given, given the interaction there, because the US Pacific Command is in charge of India and, and, and countries to the east of that. Um, the facilitation of terrorist financing networks uh, in South Asia, for example, uh, there are pre-established channels of financial support which were really established in the 1980s and they've been pretty handy. Uh, if you defeat a terrorist enemy, it doesn't mean you defeat their terrorist financing networks. There is a kind of resilience in the terrorist financing networks. If you kill uh, uh, terrorists, it doesn't mean you've destroyed their financial flows. The financial floors, the donors, the carriers, and the destinations of financial support do continue. Uh, there has been uh, the illegal sale of opium, really, from Afghanistan in the early 2000s that has financed a lot of this uh, terrorist activity against the US-led coalition. The role of the D company in drug trafficking is important. I mentioned that earlier. There is a coercion of the local populations and governance structures. Uh, that's what the Taliban did. Um, in the 1990s and the, the early 2000s, even till now. Uh, all groups in the terrorist financing network live in comparative harmony. The Afghan Taliban, the other South Asian groups, Lashkar Taiba, they are all Al Qaeda affiliates working in tandem, really. They aren't facing the kind of uh, tensions that the Nusra Front has faced with the Islamic State um, in, in, in Syria and Iraq, or the Free Syrian Army has faced with both the al-Nusra Front and the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Uh, there are porous borders um, uh, between Pakistan and Afghanistan, between India and its neighbors, Afghanistan and Iran, and they're poorly policed, actually. So this facilitates uh, the flow of funds as well as fighters and arms and so on and so forth. And given the age of the, uh, age of the internet, the, the flow of information is really free-flowing. And that's been a big development in the early 2000s, really, compared to the earlier ages. Um, there are a lot of South Asian expatriates in the Gulf countries who can be, uh, most of them licit, but can be exploited, are being exploited by terrorists to fund, uh, to, to, to really use for funding purposes um, uh, for their own ends. Uh, Again, given the pre-established channels in the Middle East of financial support from previous wars, uh, the Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was the precursor organization of the Islamic State, had established through Syria um, uh, a lot of uh, 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 terrorist financing facilitation networks, uh, both of fighters as well as funds. And those hadn't been damaged uh, at all. And they have been used afresh by Al-Qaeda uh, in Iraq's uh, uh, new Aftar, the Islamic State, and be the Al-Nusra Front. Uh, one important source is the illegal sale of oil from Iraq and Syria, essentially going to Turkey, to Iran, and Jordan, but mostly to Turkey. So that's been, that's another porous border, the Syrian-Turkish border, or the Iranian, uh, uh, or the Iraq-Turkish border, really. There is the role of oil brokers uh, and smugglers in this oil smuggling across the border to, to uh, Turkey from Syria and, and Iraq. There is the ingratiation of locals in Iraq by ISIS. Uh, the the so-called Sunni Awakening Councils are no longer that awakened. They are collaborating, as it were, 
with the ISIS guys. So you don't see the kind of Sunni opposition in Anbar that you did um, 10 years ago. Um, uh, or that's seven years ago when General Petraeus really, uh, really brought forth the Sunni awakening in a big way. After a war of attrition and, and infighting between ISIS and the Al Nusra Front, uh, ISIS is the predominant group right now, and it's incorporating and co-opting a lot of the Free Syrian Army fo uh, uh, foot soldiers as well as the Al Nusra Front. Uh, the ISIS, uh, Boko Haram, uh, material support, ideological support, and information technology support is a striking phenomena. Um, Abu uh, Bakar Shekau, the uh, Boko Haram um, uh, Nigerian um, um, honcho, as it were, is so impressed by Abu Bakar al-Baghdadi from ISIS that they, they've kind of collaborated beyond inspiration into, and as I said earlier, Boko Haram is also collaborating with the D Company, which is again a South Asian criminal dumb terrorist network with tentacles in, in the Middle East as well. Um, the efficacy of terrorist financing networks, um, that's kind of important. Uh, in terms of the achievement of objectives of donors and recipients, uh, the Soviet forces left, so the terrorist financing networks were effective in the first uh, Afghan war, then the U.S. led coalition is fleeing. So I would say the, the, the terrorist financing networks are pretty effective in their objectives. Um, the same uh, was the earlier Iraq war when, when we had to leave. Uh, so I think the terrorist financing networks who are still resilient are pretty much uh, successful, much to our chagrin and to the chagrin of the free world. And for those of us who hate terrorism in any form. Uh, one more measure of efficacy is that both in South Asia and the Middle East, uh, because of their uh, diversification of resources and the resilience, funding networks are flush with funds. Um, and thirdly, the terrorist financing networks are resilient to withstand any counterterrorism or countering financing of terrorism strategy. So from listed charities in South Asia, there is a use of using trusts in mosques and of cash couriers exploiting the poorest bo borders. By, by the South Asian groups. Also, uh, there are reports that the Afghan Taliban use fake identities to own and operate bank accounts of charities in Pakistan. Uh, and the fleeing Taliban operatives like Mullah Omar and others of his ilk withdrew cash and carried it to Pakistan and to the Taliban embassies in the Gulf. And if you remember, um, only three countries recognized the Taliban in the first go in 1996. Pakistan, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. Um, the terrorist financing networks are also resilient to withstand the, the countering the financing of terrorism measures in the Middle East with cash couriers and cash transactions and barter and oil smuggling and laundering mechanisms to move the proceeds of the sale of smuggled oil. Now, there is apparently, from some reports, laundering taking place uh, to, 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 to canalize or to channelize funds from the Gulf donors uh, through banks in London and Europe to Turkish banks and then Turkish merchants handing over the, the funds to, to um, uh, the forces in Iraq, the ISIS guys and the Al Nusra guys. So uh, the resilience of, of these terrorist financing networks is really remarkable. Uh, CFT measures, sanctions have been um, uh, uh, very useful in, in terms of name uh, and shame deterrence element, in terms of actually stymieing the flow of terrorist funds, not very successful. Uh, same way in the Middle East, uh, uh, few, uh, uh, you know, given, given the fact that the Middle East, like South Asia, uses a lot of non-banking channels, it's difficult to enforce sanctions measures beyond the proverbial name and shame. Uh, outreach measures by the USG, especially the US Treasury, has, have been remarkable. Uh, uh, both in South Asia as well, especially the Gulf countries, where they really uh, tried hard to to bring to the attention of of, of governments, uh, state, you know, all the Gulf states in Middle East and Turkey, that that there is a need, there's a pressing need to curb the flow of of terrorist funds by better regulations, by better monitoring of charities, by really monitoring individuals so that they don't export funds and fighters outside, including to South Asia. Um, 
there are regulatory uh, lacunae in terms of lack of adequate terrorist financing laws uh, and regulations and, and sanctions measures against wrongdoing, um, both in South Asia and the Middle East, but hopefully things are improving in at least South Asia and the Middle East. Um, a number of jurisdictions like the Qataris and the Kuwaitis have come out with money laundering laws, but the execution is uh, really something that remains to be seen right now. They're very fledgling, really speaking. The, the investigatory capacity is pretty weak, both in South Asia and in the Middle East. So that's, that's a thing of concern to the U.S. government. What are the takeaways uh, for policy? The, the, the South Asian terrorist financing networks rely on funding from the Gulf amongst local sources also. Porous borders result in flow of funds and fighters. The criminal groups aid and abet terrorist financing. The Al-Qaeda's call for a South Asian branch is to ensure that the Gulf donors do not lose interest in South Asia as a result of the exit of US-led coalition forces. So the use of the Al-Qaeda moniker by al-Zawahiri in South Asia is really meant to alert the donors in, in the Gulf, really, that, you know, please support us. We aren't going away. We'll keep the fight on now against India and in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So please don't leave us. Um, the Middle Eastern terrorist financing networks rely on funding from the Gulf and Turkey. As I mentioned, Turkey really, uh, uh, the, the criminal elements in Turkey and the, uh, and the money launderers facilitate uh, the, the import of funds into Iraq and Syria from Turkey. Same way you have porous borders. Uh, ISIS right now, because of success, is, is, is attracting most of the funds from the Gulf because obviously donors are looking for payoffs and returns on their investment. Any organization that has territory is really radical with the most heinous tactics like ISIS is really patronized, uh, again, by individual donors. Uh, I wouldn't say that states are, are, are involved. Uh, I would say that they probably are not, may not be doing enough to really stop these guys because when the guys go really crazy and mad, it's very difficult to stop these guys. What should be the best CFT measures? Curtailing terrorist financing from the Gulf through sanctions, especially their implementation across South Asia and Gulf states. Stricter border control measures, as I mentioned, porous borders. More aggressive outreach with South Asian states, including Pakistan and Afghanistan. There's the corruption element in Afghanistan also, which has to be taken care of. There's a clampdown on the operators of the D company, including through law enforcement, mutual legal assistance and extradition. The banks in South Asia need to implement more stringent anti-money laundering, countering financial terrorism measures. U.S. security interests need to be squared with U.S. diplomatic interests. There's a tension both in South Asia and, and, and the Middle East. For example, we have uh, we have bases in, in Qatar and Kuwait, for example. So we've got to be careful not to antagonize the Qataris and Kuwaitis, but we need to be alerting them to the fact that a number of Qataris and Kuwaitis have been listed as funding terrorism. The cooperation with India is very important. Uh, greater controls on online recruitment and fundraising need to be undertaken both in South Asia as well as in the Middle East. I believe in the First Amendment, really, but given the, the heinous nature of YouTube videos, the fact that they're radicalizing uh, many folks, including a lot of the potential and real ISIS recruits, uh, greater outreach to the worship places and exhorting the 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 uh, uh, religious minorities, even uh, here as well as in South Asia, Middle East, to really condemn uh, the harsh tactics of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the Al-Nusra guys. Um, lastly, given, uh, given the time constraint, I'll just mention very quickly um, what are the, uh, the counterterrorism measures as far as the Middle East is concerned. Uh, cutting, uh, well, curtailing terrorist financing from the Gulf through better sanctions measures, stricter border control measures, uh, the continuation of aggressive outreach, which, which the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. State Department are doing uh, with the Gulf states and Turkey, clamp down on smugglers and oil dealers engaged in black marketing, uh, you know, the export of oil that I mentioned through seizures, arrests, and designations of these uh, middlemen, as it were. Banks in the Gulf and Turkey need to implement more stringent AML CFT measures. Uh, U.S. security interests, as I mentioned earlier, need to be squared with the, the diplomatic interests. Because if we have diplomatic interests, we should be able to use more diplomatic leverage to suit our ends. A thorough wetting of the free Syrian recruits, including the 5,000 sanctioned by Congress, needs to be done. 
uh, because a lot of them may be co-opted or attracted to ISIS and the Al Nusra. Uh, greater controls and online recruitment mentioned, and greater outreach again to the worship places. Uh, many people. I'll just end with this. Many people believe that the Al Qaeda and the Al Nusra and the ISIS are three separate organizations. My sense is they're all Al Qaeda offshoots. ISIS created the Al Nusra Front in the first place. Then they fell apart. There was some uh, brotherly squabbling between them, and now they're one and the same. And the Free Syrian Army has been has been recruiting, um, uh, has been sort of recruited or co-opted by the, by ISIS essentially. And Al-Qaeda and ISIS may have a geographical division of labor, maybe some difference in tactics, but as far as the Al-Qaeda movement is concerned, uh, they are both uh, in consonance with that. And it, it appears that they're two separate entities. My, my sense of the uh, terrorist groups is um, that they are one and the same, though different forms as it were, difference in tactics and so on and so forth. Uh, thanks a lot. If I can just begin with one question before we open it up. In Pakistan, the terrorist groups have been known to have control of legitimate businesses where they don't have to raise funds, they, they generate their own funds. How common a phenomenon is that? Well, um uh, somewhat common, but I think the problem is it's like saying good Taliban and bad Taliban. It's dis it, it's difficult to distinguish between good funds and bad funds, especially when they're mixed together. So I think they may give the appearance of having licit businesses, but the funds may be mixed or laundered to the extent that it's really difficult to distinguish what are licit funds and what are illicit funds. But it is a source. It is a source, yes. Uh, like, like uh, you know, Bin Laden's honey business, for example, in Yemen. That was illicit source. Yeah, it is a source. Please. Well, uh, please uh, identify yourself and wait for the microphone. Mike Flanagan, I'm a, I'm a former member from the Hill. And uh, I have a question that's just, that's the next question after your speech today, so you could probably give two hours on this alone. But I'm going to ask you to tell me, about how much money are we talking about that's moving into these organizations as opposed to even 10 years ago? And what is a sample budget? What do they do with this money when they've got it? Good question, both of them. Right on. Uh, it's, it shows your typical oversight uh, prowess from the Hill. <laughs> uh, I would say um, uh, it could range anywhere from the hundreds of millions of dollars to even billions. For example, the D company's enterprise is is pegged at six billion. Uh, uh, the ISIS, uh, by, by by many reports, is around two billion. But it's difficult to really uh, put down uh, hard figures. But that's the thing. What do they do with it? They 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 use it for radicalization, recruitment. Uh, a lot of them, including ISIS, have well developed IT uh, websites, uh, Facebook, social media, training expanding territory, governing territory in the case of ISIS. And I would also say, going back to the uh, uh, the Taliban of the 1990s and early 2000s, Taliban was really the first terrorist group that occupied territory. So when people spring up, all of a sudden say ISIS is the first, I think the Islamic Arab of, of uh, Afghanistan, i.e. the Taliban was the first. They were really ruling uh, with, with similar heinous methods, but the social acceptability amongst the population um, was not there. Thank you. Just jump it down for me. Vijay Kumar, I'm in manufacturing, but I have an abiding interest. Just wait, wait for the microphone. Vijay Kumar, I'm in manufacturing, but I have an abiding interest in the region. Can you uh, say a few words about the state support of terrorism? Because Hafiz Saeed operates openly in Pakistan, as does Dawood Ibrahim. Yeah. So could you say a few words about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, I would say that the Hafiz Saeed operates overtly, very proudly, stomping his foot, as it were, really part of the Pakistani establishment, which he may not really be, or even may be. Uh, but in the case of Dawood Ibrahim, he, he's a fugitive from justice. He oscillates talking about his, his, his Gulf connections. He oscillates between Karachi and Dubai, with hideouts in both places. And he's been escaping the dragnet uh, of, of the law enforcement forces in a number of countries. And the U.S. has sanctioned him too. So there is 
a degree of, of, uh, of political support, there may be a degree of financial support, there is actually. Um, do all elements in Pakistan support him? I don't think so. Some of the radical elements, they do. Uh, as far as the relationship between uh, Dawood Ibrahim uh, of the D Company uh, and, and, and the state is concerned, ostensibly there is a monetary relationship also with some of the uh, uh, funds coming out of the business uh, getting diverted to some military channels uh, also, you know, especially drug trafficking, which is a big expanding industry. Thanks. We have a question from the overflow room uh, from uh, Peter uh, Humbre. Uh, how much of this money is moving through untraceable Hawala instead of bank fronts? Uh, difficult again to do a financial intelligence analysis because, it, uh, as I said earlier, in response to Marvin's question, uh, very often the illicit funds are moved with, with the illicit funds. And more than Havala, really, cash couriers uh, or cash, bulk cash, has really substituted Havala for the better part as far as uh, funds are concerned. So it would be difficult to see. Banking channels, again, difficult to see because it's laundered uh, based on some investigations, including the HSBC, the HSBC investigation. Generally, what comes out in banks is far lesser than what's flowing through cash couriers or through in the form of drugs uh, or uh, or even by Hawala, you know. So it's difficult to put numbers, but I would say cash couriers would be big, drugs would be the second one. Bank accounts, if they are discovered, then yes, but the fact is, most banks, especially those in South Asia, do not have the kind of uh, leads or the kind of investigatory capacity or even the kind of feedback from governments, including our own. It takes uh, Senator Levin's uh, subcommittee to really unearth the HSBC uh, um, um, witting or unwitting um, uh, connivance with these banks uh, in South Asia and the Middle East, respectively, the ones that I mentioned. Thanks. Hi, Tony Placido with HSBC's Financial Crimes Compliance Organization. Um, the open source reporting suggests that ISIL uh, or ISIS, depending on how you want to characterize them, are earning as much as $7 million a day in oil revenue. That suggests a volume of, of funding that really couldn't be accommodated in cash transactions or the like. Is there any information out there about how they're moving that amount of money on a regular basis and, and where it hits the financial sector, the formal financial sector? Because it, it would seem that it would have to if they're accumulating that amount of money. It would have to unless the transactions are done by a barter, which they are in some cases. Uh, uh, by barter, you know, you are smuggling in arms and... Uh, and uh, it, well, you're getting funds and smuggling or something like that. But you're right, most of it is cash. It has to be washed in some banking channel. So far, that's, I think, a job that's cut out for the USG and Turkey especially, because among the jurisdictions around Iraq and Syria, Turkey is really the jurisdiction which is the preferred jurisdiction of choice. Eventually, because of a lot of this oil is, is resold also. You know, if one broker buys it, he sells it to a third and so on and so forth. And given the fact that it's sold for as low as $15 um, um, a barrel, given the $100 a barrel international rate, um, there are a lot of middlemen making money. So yes, it has to be washed in banking channels and investigations uh, probably would be done and could be done in that. But given the problems we're facing with Turkey diplomatically and its support of ISIS, again, the domestic considerations. The PKK is something that the Turks are very wary about. They vary about people in Kobani, the Syrian Kurds, they vary about the Iraqi Kurds, and they vary about the Iranian Kurds. So you have political considerations coming in the way of, of law enforcement or investigatory collaboration between the US and Turkey, for example. Thanks. Hi, Dan Campos, Department of Treasury. I uh, just had a question. Uh, you mentioned earlier Iran and UAE as facilitators of terrorism finances or the flows going through those countries. Do you see a, any, any divides on a secretarian level between these financial institutions? Uh, well, you talk about sectarian levels, you talk about Shia Sunni? Sunni, uh, Sunni uh, 
banks versus Shia banks? Not really, not really, because the the behavior of the Iranians is uh, very complicated also, because on one hand, uh, they don't like Al-Qaeda, that's the Sunni radical element. On the other hand, they let it pass, given the important condition that none of their nationals should be joining them. That's one condition. And then they, second is they, they, they would not be perpetrating any terrorism within Iraq. So I don't think there is a Sunni Shia, because when it comes to money, there is no Sunni no Shia. When it comes to terrorism, there's no good Taliban, there's no bad Taliban. Terrorism is terrorism is terrorism. Even General Petraeus was, uh, was very categorical in mentioning there's no pact Taliban, there's no Afghan Taliban. The Taliban is the Taliban is the Taliban. You know. Uh, I am retired Colonel Sajjad from Bangladesh, sir. For the last seven years, I am teaching in the Islamic schools and in the madrasas. The problem is too big. One example I'd like to give you is that every Muslim gives 2.5% of his annual income for the zakat. Mm -hmm. Hadiyah, you can give any amount you like. And every Islamic bank has 10% CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Now, how do you monitor them? That's number one. Number two. Whenever we talk about Middle Eastern policies and every problem in Afghanistan, South Asia, everything, we talk about order and interest. But we don't talk about harmony and healing. Motivation, people to be motivated, donors, give, giving charities, they don't know where the money is going actually. Uh, we have 7 million madrasa students and 300,000 mosques. All of us give, even I give money to them. I don't know where the money is going. So people have to be motivated and told in a massive scale that give the money and ensure where it is going. That point, sir, we must keep in mind. Thank you. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you for raising this. Uh, and I think the state of Bangladesh has been doing a lot of uh, good stuff uh, and trying to cooperate with the countries in the region, including with India. Uh, there is this need, and I think when in banking, the most important thing is the banks that these charities or these trusts bank with are very important and that's why we have uh, know your customer standards. Before you take an account, uh, any account, corporate account or individual account, you should be very careful and do a due diligence as to whom that account is, who's even the beneficial owner of that account. About your question about donors, uh, I, I agree a lot of the small donors um, give funds out of religious obligation, purely religious, no political purpose, not terrorism. But the big donors are the ones who really vitiate the whole giving spree. Um, and I think, uh, then again, it comes to the banks, really. Um, a lot of stuff the banks ha are, have to do with, is with the collaboration of the intelligence agency and the law enforcement agencies. Uh, whether in Bangladesh or in India or elsewhere, especially in the US, the banks uh, are blamed and guillotined time and time out. The important thing is, it can't be a one-way flow of information, only from the bank to the law enforcement authority. It has to be both ways. Banks need some guidance. Who are the bad guys? Whom should be ostracized from the system? Whom should be quarantined from the system? Who to avoid? That guidance is, in many ways, lacking. Uh, I not want to go into the details, given the constraints of time, but it suffice to say that the banks and the law enforcement uh, agencies, uh, that's important. And as I mentioned earlier, the 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 Muslim communities, uh, who are most of them, 99.999% of them, are, are innocent givers, uh, need to condemn the fringe radical elements across board, India, Bangladesh, uh, Saudi Arabia, US, wherever else. Thanks. Let me ask this. Um, is there any evidence here of state support of terrorism uh, to the particular organizations that you're talking about? Uh, uh, is uh, are, there, are there particular states in the region that uh, we know are laundering the money, but that the ultimate source is the state itself? Uh, uh, very good question, but very difficult to answer as well, because Marvin asks the best questions. Um, um, state funding, uh, to the extent Gulf donors, uh, some states have had this official policy that we'll be getting rid of all all the Shias and we want to obliterate all Shias, for example, so on and so forth. That's what we hear in news reports. Uh, is, there, is that their official policy? Maybe not. 
Uh, but, but the rich donors from within their states, some of whom may be politically connected, like the Al Rajis, for example, mentioned in the case of Al Qaeda and Bin Laden, uh, that they are are really uh, difficult to monitor for obvious reasons because they have political connections. So I would say the state per se does, unless there is an actual state sponsor of terrorism policy per se. But the state may be looking the other way and allowing this laundering activity through its banks and financial institutions. And the laundering activity doesn't only take place in South Asia or, 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 the, Mid or the Middle East. It goes all the way to London and to European uh, uh, markets as well. Uh, Michael Hudson from Georgetown University. I wanted to follow up on the first question that was asked because I think it's a very important one and it has to do with numbers. Uh, we all know from our studies of international relations that the ingredients of power are, are not just uh, numbers of soldiers on the ground and numbers of tanks, but also other kinds of financial and uh, material resources. And I wondered if, if you can be a little bit more specific about the numbers uh, uh, involved here. You said that it could be millions of dollars, it could be billions. But can we be a little more precise and, and try to identify over a particular period of time uh, what kind, what order of magnitude are we talking about? And secondly, can you say anything about the trend in funding? For example, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here that ISIS is on a roll and maybe more money is coming in. And if we knew that they're getting more money this month than they got last month and so on and so on, that would certainly be a, a kind of a force multiplier for them, and it might explain things like why uh, some of the Taliban leadership has just shifted its alliance to ISIS from Mullah Omar. And I'm wondering if you if you have an idea of whether you know ISIS is sort of carrying the day here, and if if uh, and what that would mean. Um, great question, Michael. Um, I would say that in terms of the numbers. Uh, Terrorist financing is very hard to identify and trace A and B. There are very few uh, terrorist financing laws across jurisdictions that adequately criminalize terrorist financing. So what money is actually in which stage of the terrorist financing cycle, which is raising money, storing money, moving money, and, and using it for terrorist attacks? Uh, that's one problem. The other is, is the fact uh, that, that terrorist financing, as I mentioned earlier, entails so much more in terms of indoctrination, radicalization, recruitment, training, media management, and the actual perpetration of terrorist acts. Bin Laden, for example, before 9-11 was drawing something like $30 million a year. So those were kind of hard numbers. Um, talking more recently about ISIS, a uh, few million dollars uh, a day from oil which is a uh, spigot that's still open. Nothing really has been done given the, the vicarious interests of different parties involved, commercially more so, and some politically as well. Um, in terms of how much funds it has, different accounts from a few hundred uh, million to, to a few billion. But the fact with ISIS is they are taxing, they are extorting money from their, uh, their, from their constituents as well. It's like the government who who does the tax and spend frenzy. Uh, so those are the approximate numbers. But it's always hard to identify and trace uh, which assets are involved in terrorist financing, which are not. So therefore, it becomes difficult to quantify to exact numbers. I have a question here from the overflow room from Dylan Clement. Uh, IRI, so International Republic Institute. Um, there's much mention of, of ISIS uh, attracting money from, from the Gulf, and at the same time, there's a perception that ISIS is self sufficient. Uh, how do you reconcile this? Okay. Uh, my, my sense is that it's not self sufficient as, it, as if it's drawing funds only from itself. Because if you look at the oil smuggling across the board uh, from the Syrian border and the Iraqi border to Turkey, there are Turkish elements and others who are involved. So you can't really say that they're self-funding. So I think it's a fallacy to even to even label it uh, or or delineate it as as self-funding. Uh, it's drawing taxes from, it's extorting, it engages in kidnapping for ransom. That's one. 
And the fact that I mentioned earlier, initially the, there may be some state sponsorship also, either directly uh, or through rich donors or through individuals I mentioned earlier where the state is turning the other eye. It's either um, um, letting these things happen, A, or B, uh, it doesn't really know what's happening, which is difficult to really uh, uh, accept given the fact that these rich donors have connections with states, uh, uh, state operators or state persona. Let, let me, uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Jared Feldschreiber, uh, Russian News, uh, uh, Rian Novosti. Uh, can you explain how maybe the F FBI and the FSB have helped to thwart some of the uh, jihadism, um, maybe in the Caucasus or in, uh, in throughout the Middle East? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, the FBI has been working with a lot of international um, law enforcement agencies, uh, essentially through intelligence sharing. Uh, and. They aren't open instances, open reporting of joint operations per se, but yes, in terms of intelligence sharing, but if we see what happened to one of the Boston brothers, you know, the Russians gave information to the Bureau uh, and the Bureau really slept over it, as it were, uh, for various reasons. I mean, the same thing happened with the Phoenix memo as far as the FBI is concerned uh, pre-9-11. So uh, there are certain gaps there, uh, but yes, uh, in terms of intelligence sharing, the FBI, not only the Russians, but across the board, is pretty actively engaged in a robust effort, including averting a lot of the attacks uh, here uh, that, are that have not occurred, thanks to the watchful eyes of the Bureau and its state and local partners. I mean, when you talk about the FBI, you can't do it in isolation. FBI heads the Joint Terrorism Task Force um, in a number of jurisdictions, so it's the combined effort of the FBI and I'm a straight, uh, strict votary of federalism, you know. So I believe in, in more empowerment of the state uh, and, the, and the locals also. So I think the, the Joint Terrorism Task Force has uh, been successful and, and, and the FBI has been collaborating essentially through in, to intelligence sharing two-way um, with the Russians, uh, the Indians, and Pakistanis, and so on and so forth, yeah. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Fatima Anani. I'm from Georgetown University. Um, so following Dr. Uh, Marvin's question regarding um, states funding uh, terrorist organizations and with the re uh, specific uh, regards to ISIS, um, how would you explain um, that some certain states who have strong relations with the US and the UK um, still support um, or fund like the ISIS um, given that they have threatened uh, those countries? Well, different states have different national interests and they have different motivations and they have different constituents. So they may have friendly relations with the US, but they have their own domestic compulsions, not to justify what they do, either overtly or covertly, but they have their own interests and many a time their own interests clash with the U.S. That's why one of the steps I suggested was more more aggressive outreach, both in, uh, which the Treasury is doing and the Department of State is doing. And I think when you say outreach, it could extend to even overreaching or arm twisting at times. Because for us, our national interest is keeping the U.S. secure and our allies secure also. So it has to be explained to the 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 states where such funding originates from that in the long run, or even the medium run, it's in their interest. For example, the Saudis have really realized that, and the Kuwaitis realized that, um, and the Qataris have realized that. But, but again, I always believe, just cobbling, and the Turks also did that, just cobbling together a, a hastily framed terrorist financing law, if it's not implemented adequately, doesn't really make sense. I mean, I'm always looking for hard figures, as Michael mentioned. So what are the seizures? What are the arrests? Uh, uh, what has been seized? What, uh, how many arrests are there? What are the prosecutions? What are the convictions? What impact does a certain uh, countering the financial terrorism measure or counterterrorism measure have in, 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 in stamping out or in curbing terrorist financing? Uh, so that's what I'm looking at. So just having a law and appeasing the US uh, should not play and will not play henceforth, I think. Thanks. Um, 
I'm not seeing another. Well, let me let me ask one since we have just a couple of minutes left. Since most of the terrorist organizations don't go on the market to buy planes or tanks or heavy artillery, therefore, there we could argue that their ability to carry out the kind of guerrilla operations that most of them do uh, doesn't require very much money. Uh, that they can they can live off the land, if you will. Uh, they can tap on the grievances that people have and that are willing to to keep the insurgency or the uh, or, or, or the uh, whatever, whatever the actions may be going, even in the absence of large sums of funds. So, uh, would you agree then that? We really have not necessarily gotten, uh, uh, we may be able to stymie groups uh, such as we, we now face with ISIS in, in Iraq, but that uh, this is only a very small part, however important it is, of the, of the counterterrorism that uh, we are going to need to really get the upper hand on most terrorist groups. Uh, great question as always, Marvin. Thanks. Um, Countering financing of terrorism is, is not the only strategy, as Marvin said. There is the diplomatic strategy, there is the outreach strategy, uh, and other elements of intelligence sharing and law enforcement, which uh, in tandem with, because no strategy is exclusive, it would be this strategy or that strategy. It, it is a potpourri of a number of strategies depending on the terrorist group in the country. About the arms, I would say a lot of them have been left by us especially in Afghanistan, which have been exploited by the Taliban and other criminal gangs. Similarly, in Iraq, ISIS has captured a lot of what we had left behind with the Iraqis. They have, they have pillaged Iraqi banks. They have plundered uh, uh, the depots of arms and ammunition that we had left behind for the Iraqis for their security. So, um, and very many times, um, terrorist groups do not uh, need huge armies ISIS is more like an outlier in that case. They can do with small arms and ammunition. Uh, anything that causes mass hysteria and fear uh, and dread among the population that they govern or they coerce, I would add, uh, is sufficient to keep the rebellion uh, within their population at bay. Well, I think what we've, uh, we've certainly learned today is, uh, if we didn't know already, is uh, how murky subject this is, how difficult it is to get a handle on what's out there. And yet, uh, despite my, my perhaps uh, uh, saying that it doesn't take much in the way of money, indeed, financing is going to be very critical to our gaining the upper hand. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Amit Kumar, uh, who I didn't properly introduce at the beginning, and I was remiss in that. If you note on your uh, on the flyers that you have, uh, his very extensive background here. I'll see that you'll see that he was eminently qualified to discuss this topic today, and we want to thank him for throwing light on again a very murky topic. Thank you.